Hi everyone, this is Pastor William with the Sunday School lesson for this week. We've come to the final letter in our series on the seven letters to the churches in Revelation. And today we look at what Jesus has to say by the Spirit to the church in Laodicea and also to us. Let's look at our scripture reading. Revelation 3, 14 through 22. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, we have our map once again to keep us oriented to the various cities and where they're at. We have John, who's on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. He's in exile, seeing these visions of Jesus. And then we have Laodicea here, uh, 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. And if you'll remember, the letters began with Ephesus and have traveled around this sort of a circle here um, clockwise now, and we've gotten down to the city of Laodicea. Colossae was a city just 10 miles away from Laodicea. Earlier, Paul had written a letter to this church called Colossians, which mentions the city of Laodicea several times. These are the remains of a city wall. The city was situated on major north-south and east-west trade routes, and so it was a commercial trading city. It was a prosperous city, able to rebuild after a devastating earthquake in 60 AD, which was not too long before the book of Revelation was written, and it was able to rebuild without imperial help. Laodicea was known for several things, its banking industry, which once again points to the wealth of the city, its textiles, including its uh, cloth, uh, making of clothes, and a medical school. This is some stadium seating that was used for public gatherings in this ancient city. Uh, can you imagine sitting on these rocks for meetings? It should make us certainly be thankful for our cushioned chairs uh, each Sunday morning at church. All right, the situation in Laodicea. Something is seriously wrong. This letter is arguably the worst of the seven in terms of tone and critique. In verse 16, Jesus says, I will spit or it could also be translated, vomit you out of my mouth. In other words, they make Jesus sick. How would you like to hear a message from Jesus where he said to you, you make me sick? Verse 17, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. They have shut Jesus out. Verse 20 presents a picture of Jesus on the outside, knocking, hoping to get in. And they need to repent, as Jesus says in verse 19. When we consider what's going on, it isn't exactly clear. They're doing well, verse 17, Jesus has them say, I am rich, 
I have prospered and I need nothing. And all of this in a time of persecution, which raises some questions about how this could be so. We've already seen in the context of some of these other letters that persecution can bring economic hardship. But the Laodiceans are doing just fine. Perhaps they're using their wealth to keep them out of suffering through bribes or calling in favors and in general using their influence. In verse 17, Jesus tells them the truth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. They think they're faithful. They haven't denied Jesus, perhaps having used their wealth to get out of persecution. But in reality, they aren't standing up for Jesus either. If it's true that they've bought their way out of testing, they are avoiding true faithfulness to Jesus. In verses 15 and 16, Jesus says, You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The idea of this hot-cold contrast with lukewarm being somewhere in between seems to be that they're trying to be something in between two extremes. They're trying to have it both ways, being faithful to Jesus, but also not having to suffer for him. But the truth is, they're neither standing up for Jesus nor denying him, but are doing something in between, hence the label lukewarm. Now the Laodiceans didn't have good drinking water, so they would have understand Jesus's image here of spitting out bad water, and they would have gotten the message that Jesus doesn't approve of their behavior. Now let's look at Jesus's message to the church in Laodicea. Verse 18 picks up the last three words of verse 17, poor, blind, and naked, and says this, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. In these verses, Jesus gives them the answer to their problems. First of all, they are poor, even though their city is famous for all of its wealth. The answer Jesus gives, buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. Refining is a common metaphor in scripture for testing and persecution. Jesus is saying, gain true treasures that come through enduring testing. Their second problem, they are naked. Even though their city is famous for its clothing industry, the answer Jesus gives them, buy from me white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. In the book of Revelation, white garments have to do with righteous deeds, including suffering. Revelation 19 verse eight, in chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Jesus is saying, gain true righteousness through enduring testing. Their third problem is that they are blind, even though their city is famous for its medicine, including eye medicine. The answer Jesus gives them, buy from me salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus is saying, gain true vision so that you can realize your situation of unfaithfulness. Jesus' call to change. Although judgment is threatened in this letter against the Laodiceans, Jesus says in verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous 
and repent. His warnings come because of his great love for them, so that they will listen to his message and have a change of heart and behavior. In verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, this is a popular verse, and it's often used to speak of becoming a Christian. But in context, it is spoken to those who are already Christian, but need to repent as a part of a process of being disciplined by Jesus. In this verse, Jesus is looking for those in the church in Laodicea that he can share fellowship with. And this fellowship is pictured as sharing a meal together. And the path to this fellowship with Jesus is repentance. They have shut him out, and so they must let him back in. Jesus speaks to us. Verse 22, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is speaking to all the churches. Uh, who will listen to him, not just the Laodiceans. And so once again, as with all of these seven letters, we need to ask ourselves, do we have ears to hear what Jesus is trying to say to us in this letter? Lesson one, we often don't see when we're failing. The Laodiceans thought they were fine. They thought they were faithful, and no doubt they probably expected a good word from Jesus. They were clueless, having deceived themselves. And we, too, can be unaware of our failings and faults. We, too, can rationalize away or explain away our unfaithfulness to Jesus and deceive ourselves and be clueless to what's really going on. And I would say this is why we need to maintain our relationships with God and with others so that we can receive admonition and correction when we stray off the path. We need others. We need each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord, because when we isolate by ourselves as Christians, we're setting ourselves up for failure. We need a close relationship with God through prayer and the reading of scripture so that God can speak into our lives and challenge us and teach us. And we need to have strong fellowship and connections with fellow believers because we all have blind spots. We all have areas that perhaps we haven't learned about yet where we're failing God in various ways. And other brothers and sisters in the Lord can speak into our lives and help us out along the way. Now, as Americans, we love our privacy, right? We love to have these boundaries where, you know, some things you just don't talk about with other people, and religion is usually one of them. But as Christians, we are called to love each other enough to help each other see our faults so that we can repent and receive the blessings that God wants to give us. Lesson number two. Even when we fail, Jesus still loves us and invites us to come back. As in verse 19, Jesus admonishes us because he loves us. And in verse 20, he knocks on the door of our hearts and of our church's uh, door as well because he wants to be in fellowship with us. Even when we sin and when we fail God and are under threat of judgment, like the Laodiceans are in this letter, Jesus still wants us to hear him and to respond with repentance so that we can be in relationship with each other. We may shut Jesus out of our lives, but he still constantly pursues us because he loves us. A third lesson, beware the dangers of wealth. All through the New Testament, wealth is seen as potentially dangerous. 
For instance, in Mark chapter 4, verses 18 through 19, the parable of the sower, the seed among the thorns represents, quote, those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Wealth can choke out and kill our Christian faithfulness. Another verse from Jesus in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, he says, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. Jesus is warning us not to even desire to have an abundance or more than we need of wealth and possessions. Now, of course, wealth, when it is used to help those in need and to further the mission of the kingdom of God on this earth is a blessing to everyone involved, the one who has it, the one who gives it, and the one who receives it. But when it's just used for our own personal comforts and sense of security, it becomes an idol to us and a stumbling block. And this seems to be how the Laodiceans were using their prosperity. A final lesson. Jesus wants us to be truly faithful to him. In verse 15, as we saw, he said, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. Like the Laodiceans, we sometimes try to have it both ways. We want to be faithful to Jesus, but we also want to be comfortable and we want to fit in with people around us. We want what we want. That's not what is God's will for our lives. We don't want to experience the downside of faithfulness. You know, things like suffering and ridicule and making hard choices and making sacrifices that are a part of what it means to be faithful to Jesus. As we end, let's remember Jesus' words of encouragement for faithfulness. Verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. This is one of the many blessings that have been talked about in these seven letters that are promised to those who remain faithful until the end. May we each receive from Jesus these promises that he gives to us. And that is my prayer for each one of us.